So I called it the outer self. Uh, and I think you all understand the reason for that. Uh, the inner self we dealt with last time, the outer self is actually our environment because of our absolutely inseparable relationship with it. And inevitably, in this dialogue, of course, uh, in this particular section, everything Sensei is saying is based on the principle of Esho Funi. You all understand, I think, Esho Funi, the inseparability of oneself and the environment, or uh, a person, or a life, a living thing, and its environment. The two are inseparable because uh, one's own life condition, whatever it may be at any given moment, is reflected by your environment, and then, of course, reflects back onto you. So if you're in hell, then uh, your environment will be in hell, and your it'll be a hellish environment that reflects back to you. Uh, likewise, if you're in Buddhahood, then your environment will be in Buddhahood too, though it's difficult sometimes to believe it. This is so. And it's the Buddhahood in your environment will then reflect back onto you. So this is why we get benefits, through the fact that gradually in this practice we are making our life condition more and more in the state of Buddhahood. And it's that Buddhahood which reflects back to you and brings benefit. Hmm? So, uh, as you know, Nichiren Daishonin described it as being like the body and the shadow. If you bow with respect to your environment, for example, then your environment will bow with respect to you. It's exact and totally inseparable from our lives. So, what Sensei says right at the beginning of this is, instead of remaining fixed and immutable, meaning unchangeable, the environment changes according to the life it supports. According to the life it supports. According to the life state of that living entity which the environment is supporting. So the problem with this is, this fact, the inseparability of ourselves and our environment, the problem is that because of our egos uh, as human beings, we tend to think that we are the center of the universe. That's the big problem. That nothing exists in a way except us and our environment. And when one is egocentric in that way, of course you ignore or despise everything else that is the fact that everyone else has environments, that your next door neighbor also has an environment. Your next door neighbor is a living entity, the center of that environment. Just the same as you're in the center of your environment at number 81, they're the center of their environment at number 82, whatever street it is. So, of course, inevitably, in fact, environments are overlapping each other. So not only, in fact, does your environment reflect your life, and you're at the center of that environment, but also, you are, in fact, sharing that environment with all sorts of other people and things. So naturally, if you just think you're the center of the universe, I'm not saying you, I'm sure none of you ever think that, but I'm sure you did before you practiced. Uh, if you're just totally absorbed in yourself and what's happening around you, inevitably, of course, you ignore the other environments that overlap you. And as a result, disharmony arises, doesn't it? So, uh, the Buddhism teaches one through the principle of Ichin in Sanzen that there is not just one realm, oneself, but also there are two others the realm of society and the realm of the land. Those are realms that overlap into your life and also into every other living things of environment which is around you, do you follow? 
So in a way, you are the center of the... What's happened suddenly? Oh, airplanes. So in a way, you are the center of the universe. That is true. Because your environment actually goes out and out and out to the furthest stretches of the universe beyond imagination, Buddhism is saying. So in that sense, you are the center of the universe. Each one of us is. And each one of us has the universe, therefore, within us. We have an inseparable relationship, not just, you know, with the people next door or in the office where we work, but it goes on and on outwards to the limits, only there are no limits, of the universe itself. So in that way, we contain the universe with us, with that total connection with it. But at the same time, of course, we have to remember that every other living thing has an environment and that those environments in many, many instances overlap. So the oak tree at the bottom of your garden has an environment and that environment very much overlaps your environment. The oak tree, if it could think, would probably think that it was the center of the universe and nothing else mattered except the patch of earth it grew in and that it grew well and strongly and got enough water and created acorns and created more oak trees. That's, you know, the concern of the oak tree problem. But the fact is uh, that the oak tree is overlapping your environment and you overlap the oak tree's environment. So you, know, you have to look after that oak tree. Just the same as Sensei said, it's not by chance that you have the neighbors you have living next door to you on the opposite side of the street. It's not by chance. You have a karmic connection with them in some way. Because of cause and effect, you live next to the people who live next to you and opposite you and so on. That's a thought, isn't it? So he said we must look after our neighbors because they're an intimate part of our environment and through some strange karmic connection of cause and effect, that is why they're there. So the problem always, of course, in humankind is the ego and this tendency to feel there is nothing more important than oneself and nothing more important than our particular environment. So just to understand this relationship between the environment and us a bit more, uh, I thought of two uh, examples in nature, non-human non examples. The first one is thanks to David Attenborough, a book I read by him, and it concerns the common or garden mole. You all know what a mole is, presumably. Anyone doesn't know what a mole is? It's a ridiculous name, isn't it? A mole. Anyway, the common or garden mole. So the mole actually belongs to a species of animal called shrews. S-H-R-E-W-S. -E shrews. Shrews used to be totally water-living creatures. And they fed on worms. Not only did they feed on worms, but they fed on thousands of worms a day. They had an unbelievable appetite for worms and uh, ate enormous numbers of these worms every day. So at some point it seems, and no one quite knows exactly when, but quite probably in an ice age, when the water they lived in froze over, it suddenly became incredibly difficult to find worms. So they were swimming around, probably under the ice, wondering where this food had gone to suddenly. The food was all in the fridge. <laughs> and the fridge was ungetatable. And this caused them great concern and also enormous hunger, this voracious appetite, which was unsatisfied. Uh, so the cleverer shrews, uh, instinctively, of course, living as they do in the world of animality, suddenly had this idea that they'd better get out of the water onto the land in their agony for food. And so they 
came out of the water and struggled across the ground and because they'd never been sort of in the open air before with the whole sky above them and the whole universe around them it gave them a feeling of fear and the first thing they began to do was to start to painfully and they weren't very good at it at that time dig their way into the ground but amazingly of course as they dug into the ground what did they find but worms by the way this was the summertime when they did this and uh, they discovered more and more worms as they dug further and further. So it became natural to them not just only to dig a hole in the ground, but actually to start to move underground. This must have been an extraordinarily painful, agonizing process for them. But the thing was that they smelt worms, or however moles do sense worms. They smelt them or they felt them around. And this drove them on. So they got into this habit of going on and on under the ground looking for these worms you see, and creating the tunnels uh, which we know moles create today and uh, they stayed there the winter came the ice got thicker and thicker again and there they were perfectly comfortable underground eating these worms as they dug their way along created their tunnels so you can see from that there was a change in the environment of some sort probably they think an ice age and as a result of that uh, the shrew went underground but then more changes happened to the shrew because over of course thousands and thousands and thousands of years when they kept on with this tunneling and they bred again and their children went on tunneling and eating worms underground the shrew actually changed into a mole it developed tiny little eyes because underground it couldn't use its eyes. So gradually its eyes got smaller and smaller until they were totally out of proportion with the rest of its body. Minute little eyes. And even cleverer, they developed sensory areas at their backs and their fronts. So in the nose area, became very sensitive to everything. And their behinds also became very sensitive. This they developed so as a result of that, they could shuttle backwards and forwards in their tunnels without actually having to turn round. There wasn't room to turn round anyway in them. Just like a tram. Do you remember trams, any of you? Anyway, trams never had to turn round because they could go forwards or backwards, whichever way they wished. So gradually the mole was developing the most perfect physical uh, ability to go on living in this way under the ground rather than in the sea. So these changes came in such an amazing way, of course, over thousands of years. They, the mole was bending to the environmental requirements, as well as, of course, bringing about changes in its own environment. Those changes, to start with, were, had a great effect on animals, or insects, rather, other than worms, because all sorts of beetles and other forms of insects found themselves at the mercy of the worm's voracious appetite. So a beetle would tunnel its way into the ground, suddenly there was nothing there, and it dropped to the bottom of the mole's tunnel. And the next time the tram came back, it ate the insect. So not only was the worm actually, uh, the mole actually eating worms, but also it had, in the end, a very wide menu. An a, an a la carte menu of all sorts of different delicious dishes, beetles and other forms of insects, centipedes, caterpillars, and all the rest of it, as well as, as, well as worms. So it was a sort of paradise the moles had discovered. And this made them tunnel all the more, and it was also a great encouragement, of course, to breeding. The moles were thriving. They were fat and plump, and they bred, you know, at a tremendous rate. And this began to upset the environment again, this breeding of the moles, and their trenches becoming more and more and more, and their hills that got in the way of farmers. And so the farmers began to dislike moles. They were disturbing their land and causing ruts where the tunnel collapsed, or great bumps, you know, which got in the way of the tractors or carts or whatever it was in those days. And the farmers began to trap the moles. This, of course, was terrible blow to 
the mole population. And particularly as at the same time the farmers said to themselves, what are we going to do about all these moles? You know, they have such nice fur. And they gradually made mole waistcoats very fashionable indeed. And that caused even more decimation of the mole population as the farmers sold the mole skins for waistcoats and it became the most fashionable gear for the handsome young men of London to wear. So you can see the interchange there, this extraordinary sort of ludicrous, really, history of the mole. But nevertheless, you can see the effect of the mole on its environment and the effect of the environment on the mole. How they stand today, I'm not sure. Fortunately for them, moleskin waistcoats have gone out of fashion. <laughs> so perhaps they're having an easier time. Uh, another example, of course, a more, s more common one is, is bees. Bees, uh, the more bees there are, the more pollination there is. Therefore, the more wonderful flowers and fruit there are. And of course, the more honey there is, both for the bees themselves and also for us human beings. So uh, birds also like bees, not in a loving way, but they part of their daily diet. So the more bees there are again, the more the birds are satisfied, which means more birds survive. And so, you know, this extraordinary, amazing rhythm of life, this balance between all things continues. And of course, that also, that the bees and that story makes clear, doesn't it, the amazing way in which every organism uh, in the whole entire universe is supporting in one way or another another organism or organisms. We're all interdependent in the same way that we are supported for food by various forms of plants and grains, meat, fish, and so on. So it's really a, an amazing thing when one thinks about it. But of course, nature left on its own is all right. It lives in the rhythm of life in a natural way. As usual, the great problem is the human being, isn't it? Who, rather than live in rhythm with the rhythm of life, in harmony with life generally, can think and make judgment and sadly, as I started off by saying, so often finds themselves making judgment based on their egos. And as a result, we get the confusion and chaos which exists today, where the human being or human beings consider themselves the center of the universe. And as a result, you know, have destroyed to a great extent a great deal of the environment up to the present time. Don't you agree? So this is the egocentricity of the human being. Too impatient to wait for the rhythm of life. The primitive peoples like the Red Indians or the Australian Abor Aborigines understood the rhythm of life and moved with it. But sadly, uh, this doesn't apply as human beings have grown and discovered their abilities and inflated their egos so that nowadays progress is a chaotic thing. So it, today, it's hardly necessary to go through the lists of what is happening to the environment. We know that human beings are carving it up still to this day. We know that uh, if the, the environment doesn't adjust to our needs, we make it adjust itself. We tear down great vast stretches of forest and so on. And I remember the last New Century group, someone brought up with great passion the subject of hamburgers. Because hamburgers became fashionable, the demand for beef was colossal. It increased hugely. And as a result of that, of course, the Argentinian farmers wanted to cash in on it. And they tore down not only the Argentinian farmers, but also foreign companies entered Argentina and stripped huge areas of land of forests with no thought of its ecological effect, but to satisfy the demand for hamburgers and to make, of course, a handsome profit. They tore down more than was necessary. This is the way of man because greed gets a hold of him. 
and uh, uh, they created by tearing down the forests of course more grazing land for cattle so this has been disastrous in some areas of South America and this is typical of the way in which the human being has behaved and is still behaving of course there are lots of small groups of people who really are concerned about the environment and what's happening to it they're really desperately trying to do something and I think we've all seen television movies and that sort of thing of amazing projects in India and so on where they're creating uh, green rich land out of the desert uh, or another great example of course is Israel with its uh, incredible campaign to conquer that rocky sandy area with great success so in various parts of the world there are such people trying things but it's still infinitesimal and it's by no means keeping pace with the rate of destruction which is far greater and still going on and it's always going on in the name of profit the, the, the destruction of the environment uh, without thought without caring is because of man's greed it's always for profit so in the book called Before It's Too Late Dr. Petchy said this only now is it beginning to dawn on some of us that one day the consequences of our attitudes may be disastrous. But this awareness alone is not enough. What is needed is the full realization that we are unmistakably on a collision course with nature. And if we do not change course, we are destined to be the big losers. Nothing indeed can be lasting until and unless we succeed in re-establishing peace and harmony with nature. Together with that of human development, this is the basic imperative of our age. All this means that the ensemble of our artificial systems must be reconceived and managed in such a manner as to blend harmoniously with the world's natural systems. So, I mean, even reading those words makes one, one's mind boggle at the hugeness of this problem. Because it's a problem wherever you look in this planet. Instead, I just heard from one of the young men today that tomorrow at 7.15, for seven installments, there is going to be a program on Channel 4 comprehensively reviewing the whole problem of the environment and also uh, considering various proposals uh, to change what is happening, the downward trend. So if any of you want to watch 7.15 on Channel 4 each Sunday for seven installments, I don't know what it'll be like, but it may be interesting. So, uh, of course, the solution to this huge problem can only lie in an understanding of the fundamental reason for it, the cause of it. And that uh, lies in the principle of Esho Funi and also in the way in which we can actually change this situation of the egocentricity of human beings, which is a matter of the human revolution, isn't it? How else is it going to change? I'm not saying, of course, that everyone in the world will practice, and that's how the change will come. But the influence of those who are bringing about change and the success of the change they're bringing about will impress others and others will follow. because. Really, we're already probably a good way through the first phase of this human struggle to change this problem of the environment. That is to say, over the last 10 years, really, to a growing extent, more and more people have become aware of what we're doing to the environment. Before that, nobody thought about it. No one thought about it. But suddenly, people began to become aware because of disasters. That was what really caused it, some disaster in some area which was being brought about. And they realized the cause was the destruction of the environment. So that phase, in other words, of education, educating people has been going on for some time. Happily, it's been escalating and extending itself. And this important sort of preparatory phase has already begun. But of course, what it can't do is to, is to show people what they can do about it. 
it's all very well discovering that the environment is being destroyed, but unless you can give some person a, 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 some way or some hope that they can do something about it, it's of little use except perhaps to depress people immensely. So I feel that phase is going to come. I'm sure uh, that this is in the minds of sensei and of course of all of us really in a way. What can we do about it? Having the secret which is firstly an understanding of the, of the, of the reason for what is happening, isn't it? And secondly, the way to overcome it. Now, the reason is that if we are greedy in the state of hunger say then of course the environment is affected accordingly therefore the more people who are activating their buddhahood the more it will be buddhahood that is uppermost in our environments and the more harmony can gradually be achieved the more wisdom will flow to neighboring people to see the way do things about it. So you may say to yourself, well, what on earth can I do about this? And it's a reasonable thing to say, this colossal problem. But my belief is that every one of us will be able to do something about it in the future. For some of us, we may be specifically involved as specialists in this field, for example. Some people's path may be to do with that. But for other of us, we must, we've got to spread the word about this situation, about how it can be overcome, which is through human beings understanding the principle of Esho Thuni, isn't it? So Shakabuku is the most solid solution to this. But beyond the field, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> beyond the field of shakabuku of course is to spread an understanding of the principle of Esho Thuni so I believe this very weekend <coughs> sorry I believe this very weekend 10th uh, chapter right uh, 10th chapter is doing their bit in the local community at the carnival or festival in Kew and they are going to have a, dis uh, a display which explains Esho Thuni. That's great, very good for Thames chapter. But that's, one may say, well that's tiny effort. But on the other hand, probably several hundreds of people will see that display. Several hundred people will start thinking, oh, what an amazing thing, you know. Is that really true that I affect my environment so much? And it can cause uh, some, some change in outlook of those human beings. It's opened their eyes a little. Maybe they'll be shut again, you know, in the next week or so, but I don't think so. They're unlikely to forget it, that understanding of this incredible Buddhist principle. So uh, the solution to this problem, Dr. Toynbee agrees with Sensei, must be based or founded on a religion which has the answer to it and I don't know of any other religion except this Buddhism that has that answer but through the human revolution spreading to more and more people more and more people inevitably will be affecting their environment from their Buddha state and the flowing of wisdom in each one of those human beings will enable them to make some action however small it may seem, towards solving the problem. This is the point, isn't it? So Sensei talks actually about a great human movement, a great human movement to save and restore the environment of this planet. And it's got to be a great human movement because the, plan, the, the problem is so vast that unless a great many human beings in all corners of the world begin to become concerned with it and desire to take action about it, we haven't got a hope of winning. But at that point, Dr. Toynbee rightly says, we created the problem, therefore it must be within our power 
to overcome it. And of course he's right, isn't he? So it is a human movement. Maybe uh, all some people can do towards it is to, be, is to express their concern and their agitation. That is great. The more people do that, the more, of course, the politicians and the statesmen have to listen. They can't resist the power of the people. But the problem is that not everyone is so concerned as that. People live in their little places, you know, and they, they don't look over their garden fence and they don't wish to. They're apathetic. They don't say anything. They accept the destruction of the environment, basically. And probably in this country, where we do perhaps care a bit more for our environment than many other countries, since he even mentions that in his poem, doesn't he? Probably here we're quite complacent. We think, you know, we have this beautiful land. We're not destroying our environment, but we jolly well are, even here. Even here. And what's more, we're destroying other people's land. Where does the acid rain come from? It's destroying the forests of Norway and other Scandinavian countries, and the German forests as well. It comes from here, a lot of it. We're not the only sinners, but a lot of it comes from here. That is to say, our, it's our industrial chimneys that are pouring out this acid, which gets into the atmosphere and then drops in rain on these forests. If you go to Norway, you see it's a disastrous, awful sight to go through acres, hundreds of acres of forest that are destroyed. It's an incredible sight. And that in its turn, of course, is also having a vast effect on the ecology of that particular area. And still the government does nothing about it. Why? Because of profit. Because they're terrified of interfering with the production of various industries and so on. So always, it's, it, in the end, it's the greed of human beings that gets in the way. So a movement of ordinary human beings, however, the stronger it gets and the more powerful people voice their opinions, take every opportunity of expressing their concern, the more likely it is that governments all over the world will start to take action. And of course, there will be other things Someone said to me in the young men's session just now, you know, it's inevitable, isn't it, he said, that more and more disasters are going to occur because of the destruction of the environment and the disruption of the ecology. So these disasters, which appear to be natural, are not natural. They are actually man-made. So this awful situation has arisen actually originally because of the wrong religion. And the authors agree on this point. Because in terms of the Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the Judeo-Christian religions, the concept of God as the creator of all things was promoted in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And in the course of that Bible, God makes it plain that he places uh, all non-human creation at the disposal of human beings. He gives a license to all human beings to take charge of and use nature for their own purpose as human beings. It's unbelievable, but that is what the Bible teaches. So in other words, from earliest times, for 2,000 years now, and more, because it's in the Old Testament, for 2,000 years and more, mankind has had the license from God to do what he likes with nature. Well, of course, in those days, when everything was very simple, that didn't mean so much. And of course, it's true that the prophets in those days couldn't really visualize the situation in the world today when we have equipment, not only weapons of mass destruction, but we have equipment of mass destruction in terms of the environment. When we have huge conglomerates, you know, who with vast amounts of money, 
who in their greed for profit will destroy hundreds and hundreds of acres of forest or whatever for the sake of their business. This couldn't have been visualized in biblical times, it's true, but the fact remains that it was religion is at the base of it. In other words, what religion was saying was that human beings are one thing and nature and the environment is another. And they're totally separate. And what is more, the humans are the people who should be in charge of and use that nature, that natural environment for whatever they need. Anyway, we see the results of that today. However, it is true, and Dr. Toynbee points this out, that Jesus Christ, for one, was co constantly concerned about greed. You remember he went into the temple and uh, challenged the moneylenders who were greedily making their profit actually in the temple compound. And you remember he, he swept all their money and their bags and all the rest of it off the table. He was furious with them. And likewise, uh, St. Francis was a Christian who really understood Eshofuni. He really understood the relationship between the human being and the environment. So with these two examples, Sensei starts talking about this human movement. In other words, because at least Jesus Christ showed some signs of understanding, you know, the need to conquer greed, and because St. Francis also uh, was a, an Eshofuniist, hmm? you know, there, even there, there could be common ground to get Chris the Christian people uh, to join in, you know, such a human movement to change the environment. So I'm sure this will happen exactly the time I don't know, but I'm convinced it will happen. Some incredible movement will gradually spread right across the world. In a way, it's begun already, hasn't it? In a way, in the hearts of people who practice this Buddhism and in the hearts of many others who are concerned, but by no means the majority of the population of the world. So rightly, uh, Sensei points out too the natural disasters <coughs> that are occurring are in fact in the end man-made. So for instance the great plague which swept across Europe in the 13th and 15th centuries to two major outbreaks. Through those outbreaks half the population of Europe died. It was a, actually a bubonic plague carried by rats. But it was actually man-made. The people in those days thought it was an act of God of some sort, probably. But in fact, it was man-made because it arose from the stinking, filthy, awful sanitary conditions that existed in those times in the cities. And this, uh, through the rat population and its ever-increasing size, uh, was the cause of it all. So uh, it was man-made in fact. And also, as you know, in the Gosho called On the Omens, which is in volume four, I think I'm right in saying the major writings, uh, Nichiren Daishonin explains that if the minds of the people are full of fear, or if deep in their lives they're panicking, or agitated in one way or another, this can actually bring drastic changes in the climate and even cause earthquakes and so on. This is an incredible thing. But of course it's not incredible if you understand Eshofuni. You can prove Eshofuni in various ways. But it's easy to think, oh well, the climate has nothing to do with that. But of course the climate is part of one's environment, isn't it? Very much so. So down that link of life, vibrations of the human being, especially if it's in large numbers, does have an effect on the climate. You've heard me say, I expect, that in the 1950s, when the Cold War was at its worst, definitely our summers were continuously
cold and grey and horrible. Much worse than the summer we've just been going through, which had had its good moments like tonight. But it really was a cold, grey time. It was so strange. And when I understood Eshafuni, my mind went back to that period because it worried everybody. Uh, and one realised that this the, the climate was actually reflecting the depression and the coldness and fear in people's hearts. Because people were, in the early 1950s, very frightened. They're just recovering from World War II. And here it looked as if the whole world was going to be thrown into another upheaval, another holocaust, because of the Cold War situation between Russia and America. So it was a very depressing, fearful time. And this had its effect. Even now, an American survey, uh, which I read some time ago, admittedly, a couple of years ago, probably now, but it, it said that an amazing percentage of school children in America who'd been interviewed deep in their hearts carried an extraordinary fear about nuclear war. And this, of course, must have had a profound effect on their lives, though it was almost subconscious. But it was there. Probably it's there in more hearts than one imagines. This too has its effect, doesn't it, on the environment. So we can't ignore these things. So what is needed, Toynbee, as well as, of course, Sensei, concluded out of all this was that we, there must be a religion which is profound enough to be able to bring about the human revolution, basically and an understanding of life. It must bring about a revolution in thought, which in turn, because it involves a cross-section of society, would involve scientists and specialists whose job it is to plan the way to overcome all these various problems and develop a totally new approach which every citizen of the world can support. So there are great times to come but what it emphasizes is uh, the need for shakabuku, doesn't it? We really have to shakabuku thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the next 13 years to the 21st century. The action really is needed now in this matter of the environment. But in fact, they're still only in the phase of education, if you like, people's understanding, people's concern is what matters at this point in time. But at some point, action must begin. So, you know, the more people we can chakabuku, the more surely, and this doesn't apply just to us, of course, it applies to every country in the world, and the SGI movement generally, you know, the more surely this problem will be overcome b before it overcomes us. So Toynbee said, the greater man's power, the greater his need for religion. And he hasn't got a religion that really can pull him together and make him see sense and open his eyes. So this we have to do through Shakabuku, don't you agree? We have to Shakabuku thousands and thousands and thousands of people. How about that? But of course, that growth must be in perfect rhythm with our ability to look after those people. So it's not just that we're going to shuck with thousands and thousands of people tomorrow. That would be a disaster. We wouldn't be able to care for them or bring them to any understanding. But in a very natural way, as long as we desire to do this shakabuku, we'll find ourselves doing it in rhythm with the rhythm of Kosen Rufu, in rhythm, you know, with the need to provide people to look after everybody. And that's what we've always done up to now. But of course, uh, in the first 10 or uh, 10 years or so, to achieve a 25% or a 30% growth in a year, which we did steadily, that involved comparatively small numbers of people. But we're now getting to the point where it involves nearly a thousand people a year. Now, not nearly a thousand, it should be a thousand. 
we should chuck a book for a thousand people by the next Gojakai from the previous one. In another two years, it's going to be much more than that. And of course, it all snowballs, doesn't it? But we need to get clear that we have to shuck a book with thousands and thousands. We can't miss a chance, can we? And when we think about the environment, maybe it seems very distant from us what, you know, the hamburger beef people are doing in Argentina. Maybe we like hamburgers anyway. But we, we have to think about that, you know. It's, this is our job. We can, we can take action now over the environment by shakabukuing one more person who becomes aware, isn't it? Good. How are we doing, Sandra? Time for a little break. Should we go on five more minutes? Five more minutes, then we'll have a break. So uh, from there, we go on with the authors to the urban problems. That is to say, the environmental problems in cities. 